Welcome to the eighth session of APCR SHR 10 virtual, the ongoing virtual series of the 10th Asia Pacific Conference on Reproductive and Sexual Health and Rights, which are co hosted by APCR SHR 10, Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia, and CNS. Today's session is on safe abortion and sexual and reproductive health and rights in the Asia Pacific region. And it is dedicated to the International Safe Abortion Day, which the world is celebrating today. I also take this opportunity to pay homage to the iconic Ruth Baden Ginsburg, the Supreme Court judge of USA who died recently on September 18. During her 27 years on the Supreme Court, she was a crucial defender of abortion rights and a sharp critic of restrictions that sought to roll back those rights. Ginsburg had said, this right to abortion is something central to a woman's life, to her dignity. It is a decision that she makes for herself. And when government controls that decision for her, she is being treated less than a fully adult responsible for her own choices. So we have many women here, here in this session, I am sure we will take Ginsburg's dream and message forward. I now hand over the mic to our chairperson, Amy Williamson. Amy is country director, Mary Strokes International Cambodia. She has over 15 years of experience in leading and implementing health and development programs in Asia and Africa across a wide variety of sectors from safe abortion and contraception to maternal and child health disaster recovery, and community development. On a personal level, Amy is deeply passionate about and committed to advancing women's health rights and breaking down the barriers that continue to prevent women and girls access to these essential services. Over to you, Amy. Thank you, Shabha. Um, and yes, welcome again, everybody, to the eighth virtual session of Asia Pacific Conference for Reproductive Sexual Health Rights. As Shobha mentioned, today we'll be discussing safe abortion and sexual reproductive health and rights in Asia and the Pacific. I'm really pleased to be chairing this session and I'm looking forward to learning from the panel of experts we're soon to hear from. And firstly, again, a little thanks to uh, the Reproductive Health Association of Cambodia, the conference organizers and to CNS for their excellent coordination of the dialogues to date. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, um, for joining us, whether it's through Zoom, Facebook Live, or listening to the recording of this session. So thank you. These, for me, these virtual sessions have provided an opportunity to hear the latest research on pertinent sexual and reproductive health and rights themes that would have been presented at the actual conference, but are now presented online and interwoven with timely reflection and discussion of the current situation facing the region and the world as the COVID-19 pandemic evolves. And um, it's probably no coincidence that this panel is being held on September the 28th, as Shobha mentioned, International Safe Abortion Day. This is a global day of action for universal access to safe and legal abortion from a public health, human rights and reproductive justice approach. The theme of this year's campaign is telemedicine, safe, self-managed abortion and access to abortion in the context of COVID-19. In places, the pandemic has restricted access to safe abortion and all other sexual and reproductive health services with the poorest and most marginalized women and girls the most affected. This has created an urgent need to revise how services are delivered and obtained by these women. It is especially more important now than ever that abortion is recognized by governments and within health systems as essential health care. Restrictive access to abortion is tied up in outdated laws and policies and this pandemic has only made it more urgent that these policies are changed to prevent an increase in unwanted pregnancies, births and unsafe abortions. If we look to our conference themes and tracks, these presentations today cross several of them, including linking supply and demand for SRH services and exploring the effects of socio-cultural norms uh, and sexual reproductive health. But perhaps the more prescient conference track was track number five, sexual and reproductive health and rights in a changing and dynamic world. It's an understatement to say the current pandemic has rapidly brought change to our world. It's most certainly brought a new suite of challenges to safe abortion access, but these are varied across regions and will remain rapidly changing scenarios for time to come. 
While the research presented today may have been conducted in a pre-COVID time, the findings are no less important as the pandemic has only exacerbated already existing barriers. And we will find some of these topics explored throughout the rest of the session. Before we move on, I do want to acknowledge the coordination team of the International Campaign for Women's Right to Safe Abortion, whose material campaign material I just borrowed from heavily. Um, so without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our first plenary speaker. Uh, she's Dr. Suchitra Dalvi. Uh, Dr. Suchitra is a practicing gynecologist who is passionate about women's human rights, and she's known for her unflinching support for safe abortion. As co-founder and coordinator of the Asian Sa Asia Safe Abortion Partnership since 2008, she leads the safe abortion advocacy work of the network in the Asia region. She is a member of the WHO Expert Review Group for Safe Abortion Guidance, and also a board member of the India-based Common Health and UK-based Safe Abortion Action Fund. Uh, the topic of her plenary talk today is abortion and reproductive justice, the unfinished revolution. So with that, I'd like to hand over to you, Sutija. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Amy, for uh, that introduction. And I would also like to join you in thanking the organizers of the 10th APCR SHR for creating this virtual platform, which has allowed us the opportunity to share and exchange uh, despite, you know, the pandemic disrupting all the plans. So mm -hmm. thank you so much for that. Thank you so much. Uh, so as Amy said, I uh, am coordinator of the Asia Safe Abortion Partnership. Uh, I'm also board member of Inroads and a member of She Decides India. Uh, I uh, moved off the board of the Safe Abortion Action Fund recently. I'm afraid I think the uh, biodata didn't get updated. Uh, so today I'll be talking a little bit, as she said quite rightly, about abortion reproductive justice, the unfinished revolution. Uh, which was a conference we were supposed to organize in November. Uh, but my uh, presentation is going to be more on ideological positions and uh, you know political uh, strategizing uh, rather than a research topic. And I hope uh, it is of interest to those of you who have joined today. Uh, so ASAP is a regional network uh, working on safe abortion rights advocacy. And we have members in over 23 countries across the region from South and Southeast Asia, Southwest Asia, as well as the Pacific. Uh, the key groups of stakeholders we work with are young people as well as healthcare providers. And a lot of our work is on advocacy, networking and capacity building. Um, uh, we are very active online as well because we think that is also a political strategy because the politics of the online spaces reflects the policy of uh, you know, real life. So for those of you who are interested in knowing more about you know, information around medical abortion uh, or you know, uh, want to read some very interesting and edgy blogs, uh, please do find us online. We are also active on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, we uh, conduct a lot of photo campaigns. And again, this is a political move because we find that very often the faces, uh, the case studies, or the testimonies of young girls and women from our part of the world are not visible on global platforms. Um, and uh, you know, this is our attempt to make sure that uh, when you think of safe abortion issues or when you type in on Google, you will see as much from our part of the world as we do for elsewhere. <clears throat> We also encourage our young people to uh, undertake policy advocacy, uh, you know, holding our leaders and governments accountable because it is their duty uh, to ensure that they respect, protect and fulfill women's human rights, which, uh, as Amy has already said, does include, uh, you know, safe abortion rights as well. Uh, now, ASAP, like uh, all of us, have had to re-strategize in these uh, pandemic times to try and move all this work online. And one of the ways uh, we thought of, you know, continuing our networking and advocacy was to connect with our members, partners, and allies working across the region, as well as working in different constituencies, which faced very specific challenges for safe abortion access uh, during the pandemic. And uh, these are all available on our website as uh, podcasts, videos, as well as blogs. Uh, so just to say that, you know, uh, there is a whole range of conversations which don't really make it to um, mainstream global discourses, even amongst us as civil society. Uh, for example, Bhutan is a country, you know, it got locked in. Uh, although they had, didn't have a lockdown, but they got locked in because India had a lockdown. And so they had difficulty accessing medical abortion pills. Or, uh, you know, the difficult challenges that are faced by um, the sex workers community or people from the queer community. Uh, what is being called the shadow pandemic. Uh, issues around domestic violence. So these and many more conversations are available. And this was, uh, we found the best strategy to use online platform to continue to speak out for the issues that matter. And while we were building our ASAP movement, we have also been um, uh, involved in cross-movement solidarity. And one of the movements we are engaging with is Inroads, which is the International Network for the Reduction of Abortion Discrimination and Stigma. 
and we are also involved with she decides uh, which as you know was set up as a counter to the global gag rule and um, uh, do take a look at their websites and you know be engaged with the work that they are doing if that is of interest to you one of the things i wanted to share today um, is something that asap has been developing which we call the safe abortion goals now abortion advocacy as we know is a uniquely challenging uh, field given the lack of incidence data the constant politicization of abortion access and the numerous non legal barriers to safe abortion access and it's very often difficult to identify realistic priorities for advocacy given that many of us if not most of us have limitations of human resources uh, limitations of time as well as funding so we've developed a kind of a checklist and we are hoping that this is something that can be used by the movement as a whole uh similar to the mdg and the sdg framework of indicators uh countries were graded across six categories law public health social justice access to information provider behavior and media uh the checklist is designed to support the safe abortion rights movement to be able to measure the current access to safe abortion use the benchmarks to establish specific targets and to assess and evaluate progress and successes and i would like to acknowledge the team that has been working uh, you know all of us have been working together on this and we are still refining and fine tuning uh, you know what is going to emerge and i would like to thank alison um, janice and nandini for this but just in time for today's presentation we managed to uh, you know prepare a draft which we could share with all of you uh, because we are very excited about it and we really hope that many more people will uh, you know use the idea so this is a safe abortion goal or an sag fact sheet for sri lanka as a sample <clears throat> we will be sharing testimonies which are more or less representative of the country situation the recommendations will be drawn from the checklists as well as the uh, scoring uh, based on those six categories and we will also be providing a visual so this is something we thought is very important for example we have uh, youth led country advocacy networks in eight countries uh, so it may be more useful for a group like that to prioritize say for example working with provider behavior to sensitize them and ensure that they uh, interpret the existing law to the fullest extent rather than you know spending energies on changing a law which is currently showing in the red zone uh, to something more um, uh, useful for the community so we will be refining this and we are hoping to be able to share a more final version soon but we wanted to use the opportunity uh, of this day to be able to share it with everyone and uh, we would look forward to your feedback on this Now the reason why all of us are continuing to work on safe abortion rights is because unsafe abortion related deaths are still very high very high in our part of the world uh, also in sub saharan africa and if we see an overlap of that map to this one uh, with the distribution of health service providers we can see that there is a critical shortage in the same countries which have a high number of unsafe abortion deaths now we know that unsafe abortion is caused by many problems uh, beyond just uh, healthcare service provision but this is you know one of the important justifications we have for trying to articulate um, uh, the, the rationale for uh, self managed abortions and as we know uh, who recently defined self care in fact uh, they came up with the fact sheet in uh, march this year uh, which talks about you know how access to self care interventions can actually improve people's autonomy so it's not too much of a leap from there to uh, talk about self managed abortions but for me what i wanted to convey today is i think it's not just a question of logistics or ease or healthcare system. system management we need to recognize the political significance of self managed abortions because really haven't abortions always been self managed i mean whether it's using a hanger or some kind of uh, you know dodgy pills from a snake oil physician or uh, you know hot stone massages so i think for us as uh, safe abortion rights advocates the articulation needs to be very very uh, accurate and what we want really is not self managed abortions as much as safe self managed abortions so we want something where a woman or a pregnant person can self assess their pregnancy and self procure the pills whether online or through chemist self administer these in a location of their choice self conduct the process without having to visit a medical faculty facility when they have a source of accurate information but they can access a healthcare provider should they need or want to at any stage of the process and this last statement to me is the one on which springs the political significance of what we are asking for because we want safe self managed abortions to be available as a valid and safe choice and not a situation where women and pregnant persons are forced to do it you know through the black market or underground or below the radar because governments and public sector are shocking from their responsibilities so we don't also want to promote uh, safe self managed abortions as something which you know then professional bodies can say okay you know fine let's stop doing this because women are managing it safely for themselves anyway that is not the point of our ask what we want is this needs to be available in the mainstream as a valid choice and i think that is something we need to remember uh, in our in our calls for action 
And just like the oral pill one generation ago, the medical abortion pill we know has the power to disrupt the narrative and subvert the hegemonic control of the patriarchy on women's sexual and reproductive lives. And that is what we need to recognize. And the current pandemic, despite all the, the tragedy and disasters that we are seeing as a result of it, has actually given us an unprecedented opportunity to do the same. Because this is opening up conversations amongst groups of people who have never had to face it before. You know, people uh, from the middle class, uh, people who are otherwise able-bodied, uh, they are now seeing and facing the kind of barriers that many other communities have faced, uh, you know, forever. So I think this is the time and the opportunity we can uh, push this envelope forward on telemedicine as well as safe self-managed emotions. And just a light-hearted look at, you know, what uh, the COVID pandemic has done for us. You know, we need to think of it as an agent of change. And uh, as uh, civil society organizations, we are often being told, you know, think outside the box, be innovative, do something creative. And that always makes me wonder, you know, why are we constantly being asked to think out of the box? Like, what is wrong with the box? And I was very pleased to find that a well-known author uh, had similar thoughts on it. Uh, Malcolm Gladwell says, if everyone has to think outside the box, maybe it's the box that needs fixing. And that got me thinking about what are the walls of this box, you know, within which we are doing uh, say commercial advocacy. And one of the big boxes that all of us are seeing right now is neoliberalism. And I have, uh, you know, heard of it often being defined as capitalism on steroids. And uh, we are seeing the effects of it, you know. Um, the, the government is withdrawing from public sector uh, funding for health, education, among other things. Uh, there is, um, you know, third party insurance which does not include abortion services. Uh, there are people who have a lot of out-of-profit exp uh, expenses. There's public-private partnerships which aren't really benefiting the public sector. So this is something we need to address in all our conversations. And another, of course, the, the big wall that uh, surrounds everything is the patriarchy. And I thought these two images were absolutely, you know, exemplifying the hegemonic control that patriarchy has on women's sexual and reproductive lives. Um, you know, there's the there's online ad for these pills to fake your virginity. And I'm still not sure whether this is the most amazing subversion or it's the most terrifying complicity uh, with what uh, you know women are expected to do in terms of being virgins and saving themselves uh, for their husbands in uh, you know a heterosexual arranged or uh, somehow somehow being married. Uh, and this other image is the cover of a book, um, May You Be the Mother of a Hundred Sons, uh, which uh, is an exploration of the whole conversation around sex determination not just in India, but also in China, Nepal, Vietnam, where, you know, girls are married off young, they're expected to prove their fertility, have children, and not just any children, but have sons. So the whole conflict uh, between the issues of sex determination and uh, safe abortion rights has been politicized and conflated to such an extent that it has become very, very tricky to negotiate. Now, we don't have time for this today, but at some point, hopefully on the She Decides Forum, uh, we will be unpacking uh, this conversation. So those of you interested to know more, you know, do keep your eyes open for that and join us there. So why are we struggling with all these issues? It's because there is no such thing as a single issue struggle, because we do not live single issue lives. Uh, you know, as soon as we are born, uh, on our body is written the script of the politics that has been playing out for thousands of years. And which is why all the conversations we have in the SRH field, it's not just safe abortion, it's whether it's about safe motherhood, it's about contraceptive access, it's about adolescent sexuality education. We always need to talk of the intersections. Uh, we need to always use the uh, conversations around neoliberalism and patriarchy. We need to talk about public health, social justice, gender, post-gender world, sexual and reproductive labor. I mean, I've been to so many meetings where, you know, people are convinced, of course, that sex work is work, but then somehow surrogacy is exploitation. So, you know, how do we um, have those conversations uh, build common ground between them? The glorification of motherhood, conversations around ableism, because we talk of selective abortions when it comes to sex, but we're comfortable with selective abortions when it comes to, you know, uh, the disabilities, uh, conversations around racism, classism, role of big donors, big pharma. Uh, and unfortunately, all these conversations have to be had in a space where there is shrinking spaces for civil society engagement. So um, as I mentioned earlier, ASAP is uh, planning to uh, host the Abortion Reproductive Justice Conference. This is the fourth in the series. Uh, the term reproductive justice was coined by Loretta Ross, and it is based on the theory of intersectionality which states that people have different life experiences and opportunities based on how all their identity categories interact with each other. You know, their race, class, gender, and sexuality. And uh, reproductive justice attempts to move women's reproductive rights past the legal and political debate to incorporate these other framings, which I mentioned, the economic, the social, the health factors. So this conference was initiated in Canada uh, at the University of Prince Edward Island, and we will be bringing it to Asia. Uh, because we wanted to bring voices from Asia into the global conversation 
and also provide an opportunity for a focus on issues which are very region specific uh, such as sex selection child marriages migration among others two minutes left yes thank you so this conference uh, you know was supposed to have been held in november this year but of course the pandemic has changed uh, all our plans uh, and as of now we are planning to hold it in the first quarter of 2022 which is not next year but the year after that so i know it's a long way away to ask you to save the date but those of you who are interested do uh, keep in mind and we are hoping to be able to see all of you over there uh, because we want to create a world where it is unacceptable for a person to die because they were forced to seek an unsafe abortion and i want to end with this quote from arundhati roy which i think is absolutely perfect at uh, this point in time uh, who says that historically pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew this one is no different it is a portal a gateway between one world and the next and i think it is up to us to see how we are able to redefine the new normal of the post covid world for ourselves thank you so much thank you so much suchitra my gosh just so many uh, wonderful ideas in that presentation just chucked into all all into that that 15 minutes um and also some great resources and uh tools for uh partners to make sure they're more strategic in their action on the ground so incredible um i hopefully will have be able to explore a lot of this in the q and a towards the end of the session thanks so much thank you So now uh, moving on it's my pleasure to introduce plenary speaker number 2 uh this um is Sivananti Tanatiran uh Siva she is executive director of the Asia Pacific Resource and Research Center for Women or ARO uh which is a regional partnership organization working across 15 priority countries in the Asia Pacific Siva's direct, different career choices to date have included teaching, writing, commercial publishing, communications, and working at the UN, and have given her opportunities to explore uh, many work disciplines and to form her ideals of working in partnership and respecting diversity. She's now the lead conceptualizer of Arrow's Reclaiming and Redefining Rights, which monitored the progress of SRHR across five regions of the Global South. She's also the lead author of the Asia Pacific Report. She writes and advocates extensively on sexual and reproductive rights. And the topic for Siva's plenary talk today is right to safe abortion, putting women at the center of the discourse and practice. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you Amy and thank you Suchitra for that great presentation. I'd also like to thank uh the APCRSHR steering committee members uh for actually carrying through and uh in this new normal uh putting all of this information sharing and holding the conference so that uh, we as advocates can continue to like discuss and gather because clearly what the pandemic has shown us that it's a time for us to actually share information and knowledge across borders and strategize across borders and you know collaborate for action uh because you know the times just call for it so um i think that one of the things that the covid uh 19 pandemic actually kind of put uh, a spotlight right on is actually you know individuals and communities and how uh, some of us have been so um, adversely affected by the pandemic right and uh, so it uh, showed up you know the existing um, uh, gender equality inequalities that exist um, at country level uh, and uh, so one of the things that we want to do is like we want to utilize this moment to try to bring the attention of governments and systems back to women at the center right and put when we look at right to safe abortion how do we actually put women at the center of the discourse and practice so what is the uh, situation in the region so uh, despite you know all of the work and the efforts that all of us have been doing over the decades you know there has really been a very substantial gap in establishing reproductive rights in particular the right to safe and legal abortion as an indicator of gender equality at the country level um so the estimates uh, as suchitra has pointed out you know the incidence of unsafe abortion and the percentage of maternal deaths attributed to unsafe abortion continue to be high in the region and although access to safe abortion has been proven to be linked to a lower incidence um, of uh, unsafe abortion uh the progress in amending laws and ensuring access and equal access to services especially for marginalized and vulnerable groups um seems to be slow right and even in the asia pacific region uh countries like iraq laos and the philippines are actually having uh, uh are not allowing uh, abortion for uh, any reason 
you know, 17 countries allow abortion without restriction as to reason. And all of these countries impose some form of gestational limitations with the exception of China, North Korea, and Vietnam, which have different regulatory mechanisms, right? So in some countries, notably China, India, Nepal, you know, abortion laws are liberal, but many women continue to face uh, many barriers, you know, to obtaining safe and legal procedures. And um, as Amy pointed out in her introduction, you know, we've all inherited some form of colonial penal codes uh, that co criminalize abortion. Um, Tiva, can yeah? you put your slides on uh, PowerPoint slideshow? This just okay. been a request. Yeah. Right. Okay. Is that better? Yeah. Great. Okay, fine. So um, despite the progress in terms of economic growth, you know, uh, not all groups of uh, women benefit equally from these gains, right? So marginalized groups um, continue, to, which also continue to be affected by other um, uh, in, uh, phenomena like rising poverty, inequities and inequalities, and they face multiple oppressions, right? And we can only truly achieve human rights by addressing how we look at it in an intersectional way. So uh, religious fundamentalism and anti-gender ideology, as we have seen, you know, it's not the dominant discourse in the Asian context yet, but there is an increase with the rise in right-wing governments um, uh, in the region, right? And we can see this in the Philippines, we can see this in India, we can see this in um, Malaysia, you know. In addition, the narrative that local and regional values are being hijacked by external or Western agendas, you know, represents a significant um, challenge. So the growing influence of religious fundamentalism, and very often this is like kind of connected with nationalism, uh, and this, its adverse effects on the sexual and reproductive health and rights of people, including women, young people, sexual and gender minorities, and other marginalized groups has to be considered if we are to ensure a just development process and attainment of human rights for all. Now it's like, um, sorry. All right. Okay. So, um, and unfortunately, you know, the control of women's bodily autonomy is a hallmark of fundamentalist ideology that crosses religious boundaries, you know, and it's central to the way that fundamentalist ideologues exercise power. So, for example, in the Philippines, a reproductive health bill, which would legalize contraceptive, met 14 years of strong opposition from the Catholic Church. And when it was finally passed in 2012, conservative Catholic groups challenged it in the Supreme Court as being unconstitutional and delaying its implementation for more than a year. The Supreme Court upheld the legislation. However, it was struck down several of its provisions, right? And in its visit to the country in January 2015, even Pope Francis vigorously defended the church's opposition to contraception. And the experience that we see in the Philippines is far from isolated. You know, we have seen this in El Salvador, Chile, the Dominican Republic, Nicaragua, Mexico, and Brazil, are all examples of countries where the influence of the Catholic Church has been central in severely restricting or fully criminalizing access to abortion. So religious fundamentalism is not only growing in every region of the world, they're also sharing resources and strategies and coming together in alliances across the regions, right? The strategies of opposition are rooted in activating patriarchal norms that Suchitra has touched on that universally underpin the social, cultural and political systems. So this impact of religious fundamentalism, especially how it is being linked to national identity and this patriarchal kind of um, ideology on uh, what constitutes women's rights in the national context, you know, has been a worrying trend. And interestingly enough, the extremist ideologies thrive on asserting control over women's bodies, autonomy and sexuality and their daily lives, especially their gender roles. So this confluence of this conservative, religious, cultural, national, customary practice is just not being confined to any one religion or region and is often interlinked with the pursuit of political power, right? So political groups aspire for homogeneity based on ethnicity, race and religion to fuel the sense of false sense of ethno-nationalism, patriotism, and to express this as support for fundamentalists in right-wing uh, political groups and the policies they espouse, and mainly through the ballot box, right? So, for example, you know, uh, there was a very recent uh, one where the Prime Minister of India claimed that the, a certain section of society 
carefully weighs in their decision to have a child and they ought to be respected for this. And these are seen as the true patriots uh, of uh, India. On the other hand, you know, these parents with large families are people that shun their responsibilities to state, as responsibilities to state and society. So although they've not been, uh, have, uh, not been explicitly named, but these groups that do not fit in uh, with this is uh, the two well-defined, you know, marginalized communities in the country, which is basically the Muslim and the Dalit uh, populations, right? So um, the violence of population policies is being deepened as a result of three central and interrelated aspects, corporate dispossession and displacement, the intensification and extension of women's labor for global capital, and the discourses and embodied practices of the far-right Hindu supremacy as quoted by Wilson. Yeah. Uh, then of course globally we've also seen you know the attack on abortion rights right by the Trump administration which undermines bodily autonomy by denying women access to safe abortion services and the global gag rule exacerbates the prevailing structural inequalities between the global north and the global south and it also uh, reinforces the continued marginalization and discrimination of women and girls on the basis of their sexual and reproductive identities so uh, in this current neoliberal order of women's of the world you know women's bodies are made invisible and seen primarily through their reproductive capacities. So the rise of religious fundamentalism is a company. It goes hand in hand with the neoliberal economic policies in this pre-COVID time have in many ways played a role in legitimizing gender inequalities in a manner that restricts women's participation in the political and economic decision making at the time of crisis. So criminalization of abortion itself is a tool of patriarchal and structural racism. You know, it perpetuates existing power imbalances by creating vulnerability amongst the most marginalized as it is the most vulnerable who tend to be harmed by criminal uh, uh, provisions. So, and there's been consistent ideological uh, attacks by regressive schools of thought during COVID, and this is threatening our abortion rights, right? For example, the conservative movement is using the health emergency to further anti-choice and anti-gender equality um, agendas. So, for example, we had these uh, debates around aid conditionality, not only the global gag rule, but President Trump's move to defund WHO, bargaining on issues of gender and sexuality in global conversations and negotiations, for example, the USAID letter to the UN Secretary General demanding the removal of SRH and abortion from all WHO information on COVID. Uh, there were several states that de deemed uh, abortions as non-essential, thus pushing women to seek unsafe abortion. But this not only you know, uh, not about ex uh, curbing excess for now during the time of the pandemic, but deeming a service as non-essential has long repercussions because it's framed within um, the frame work of like not being vital and perhaps not being need to be paid from the government pocket, right? So these are things that we need to be very wary about from what we have seen happening during the pandemic. So the pandemic has made it even harder for pregnant people, especially from the global south, to access quality medical abortion commodity and accurate information. So in many South Asian countries, you saw the travel restrictions and sealed borders have closed the option to seek safe abortion services across the border, especially from countries where abortion services are severely restricted or non-existent. Um, according to a recent report by Goodmarker, this reduced access during COVID-19 of um, uh, unmet need for contraception will result in an additional 49 million women with an unmet need for contraceptives and an additional 15 million unintended pregnancies over the course of a year. Uh, in the first three months of India's national lockdown, uh, it compromised abortion access for almost an estimated 1.85 million women, according to a study by IPAS. So SRHR access uh, of at-risk socio-demographic groups is more adversely affected due to the intersecting inequalities and vulnerabilities. COVID uh, outbreak is acutely felt by those already marginalized, including migrants with uh, people with disabilities, refugees, indigenous people, and women and girls in low-income set settings and LGBTQI individuals. 
so uh, there was also a decrease in health system capacity because all of the resources were deployed towards COVID and increased pressure has affected abortion access even in contexts where abortion is legal and widely accessible. So movement control orders, internal and community border controls, physical distancing have uh, increased the barriers in people's ability to travel to seek abortion services, especially in countries where legal abortion is restricted, thus pushing people towards unsafe measures. So UNFPA predicts there could be up to 7 million unintended uh, pregnancies worldwide um, with potentially thousands of deaths from unsafe abortion and complicated births uh, due to inadequate access to emergency care. So uh, Marie Stopes also, um, which works in 37 countries, predicts that the closure of their services would result in 9.5 million vulnerable women and girls losing access to contraception and safe abortion services in 2020. And this could result in as many as 2.7 million unsafe abortion and 11,000 pregnancy related deaths. So in this context, what are the kind of strategies we should adopt, right? So one is addressing abo unsafe abortion requires an intersectional approach that keeps SRHR needs of uh, pregnant persons at the center. So by strengthening comprehensive sexuality information, unmet need for contraception among and enabling stigma-free access to SRHR services, early pregnancies and its consequences can be prevented. So at the time of COVID-19, it is critical that we, women from the Global South, help reposition the politics of access to safe abortion. As a movement, we need to unpack the patriarchal power structures behind this decision making if we are to understand these politics of the pandemic. So safe abortion for women in the Global South is just not about choice, but also about access. Governments should eliminate legal barriers, you know, limiting women's access to sexual and reproductive health services, commodities and information, including provision of life-saving medicines such as misoprostol and mifepristine. So governments should provide inf accurate information on medical abortion to help women make informed decisions and minimize risk to women's health. With proper information and guidance, medical abortion is a life-saving and healthcare service. So in the midst of a pandemic, it might be the most viable option for women seeking an end to, uh, to end an unwanted pregnancy, right? Siva, just one minute left. Yeah. Okay, so we, uh, uh, we need to look at uh, access to safe abortion in totality while demanding the right to self-manage abortion. We need to be careful that we do not absolve government of their responsibility to provide abortion in health facilities. And uh, medical abortion should be understood from a rights and reproductive justice perspective and in the context of bodily autonomy. So the public center ha sector has an obligation to ensure body literacy for all women and girls and provide accurate information. So the medical abortion drugs uh, need to be provided through both public and private facilities and health sectors should provide acceptable, affordable, accessible quality health care and ensure dignity, respect, uh, privacy and confidentiality. And SRHR services that includes access to safe abortion should be part of the universal health coverage to ensure access for the most marginalized. So um, we Look at, yeah, so we basically we ask for, you know, uh, an understanding, um, an intersectional understanding of abortion as a human rights issue centering on the most marginalized and vulnerable in our advocacy and our policy response. So that's all I have. So thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Siva. And um, I think that was, you took us a little deeper into um, some of the evolving, the trends, socio-cultural um, challenges, some of the structural policy barriers, but a good snapshot of the challenges already being presented by COVID, which I hadn't really seen brought together uh, in one place. So thank you. And again, I think there's lots to explore um, through our Q&A, hopefully. So everybody send your questions through. Um, now I will move on to um, announce our first abstract presentation. Uh, this is from Catherine Gambier. Unfortunately, she couldn't join us to present live, so her presentation's been recorded. Um, Catherine is Research Advisor at the Women's Refugee Commission, WRC, uh, and she advises WRC in research, monitoring and evaluation efforts across program areas. She implements and evaluates programs and research projects involving crisis and conflict-affected individuals to inform programming and advocacy 
Catherine also leads research trainings for WRC staff and global partners, and she's co-principal investigator on a multi-country study investigating the drivers of child, early and forced marriage, and has conducted research on adolescent sexual and reproductive health and family planning in Sierra Leone and Zambia. She's also provided technical support on girl-centered programs designed for organizations serving indigenous girls in Latin America, Mozambique, and the United States. She's developed automated surveillance systems and mHealth apps, evaluated global health programs, and facilitated trainings on community-based behavior change approaches. And the title of Catherine's abstract presentation is Self-Administered Medical Abortion as Effective as Provider-Administered Medical Abortion? It's a systematic review and meta-analysis. Thank you so much. Um, I will be presenting findings from a systematic review and meta-analysis on self-administered versus provider-administered medical abortion, which I conducted in my formal role at the Population Council. I'm presenting on behalf of my co-authors, Karen Kim, Kelly Nicastro, Twai No, and Bella Ganatra. Medical abortion has improved access to safe abortion where women have access to information and appropriate care. Self-administration of medical abortion has been proposed as a strategy to reduce burden on the health system and to provide convenience for women. In self-administered medical abortion, drugs are administered by the woman herself without clinical supervision. In low resource and restricted settings, women are procuring medical abortion drugs through pharmacies, drug sellers, and online to self-terminate pregnancies, some without knowing the quality of the medications or having accurate information. There is inconclusive evidence on whether clinical supervision is necessary and whether self-administered medical abortion is as safe and as effective as provider-administered medical abortion. So for this study, uh, the object objective was to compare the effectiveness of self-administered versus provider-administered medical abortion among women of reproductive age, 14 to 49 years, in any setting. So for our methods, we conducted a systematic review and meta-analysis that included randomized controlled trials and prospective cohort studies with a concurrent comparison group that compared successful abortion by self-administered versus provider-administered abortion groups. We searched a number of databases, as indicated on the slide, from inception to July 2019. Two independent reviewers um, independently extracted the data and meta-analyses were performed using RevMan 5. The Grading of Recommendations Assessment, Development, and Evaluation, or GRADE, approach was used to assess study quality, including risk of bias. This slide shows our results from that database search um, out of of approximately 6,000 records identified, we included 18 studies, which were published from 2001 to 2019, that comprised of com approximately 11,000 women undergoing early medical abortion. So that's at or under nine weeks gestation in 10 countries as indicated on the slide. We, among these 18 studies, there were, um, 16 non-randomized studies and two randomized control trials. Uh, our, our primary measure of effectiveness was successful abortion. As indicated in the forest plot on the slide, the results of the meta-analysis of the 16 non-randomized studies that were included show that there is little to no difference in successful medical abortion between self-administered and provider-administered groups. The finding is also consistent when we conducted a pooled meta-analysis for both the 16 non-randomized studies and two RCTs. The second measure of effectiveness was ongoing pregnancy. As indicated in the forest plot on this slide, the meta-analysis showed that ongoing pregnancy 
also did not differ significantly between the two groups for the 11 non-randomized study that, studies that uh, reported on this outcome. This finding is also consistent with the RCTs. So our, our findings regarding safety. While not statistically significant, uh, safety outcomes, including complications requiring surgical intervention, which is shown on the slide, favored provider administer, administration. Uh, we also uh, assessed acceptability outcomes. So self-administration is highly acceptable with the vast majority of women, approximately 85%, opting to self-administer again if they had a future ab abortion, compared to about 50% of women who were in the provider administrated group. And this fourth, fourth plot on this slide shows the pooled meta-analysis for two RCTs and 11 non-randomized studies that reported on whether women in each group were satisfied or highly satisfied with their medical abortion method. Again, you can see that medical abortion method uh, was highly acceptable among both groups. So in conclusion, women can effectively and safely induce their own med early medical abortions through self-administration and therefore may not require full supervision of a provider uh, during any stage of the drug regimen. Uh, results from this review have several policy and research implications. Policymakers at global and national levels should consider amending medical abortion guidelines to offer women the choice to self-administer early medical abortion procedures with or without clinical guidance thereby reducing the number and cost of clinic visits for women and alleviating the burden on overburden healthcare systems. This is especially important in the context of COVID-19, where health systems, including healthcare staff, globally are strained and access to clinic-based care is restricted. And at the same time, we're seeing increases in gender-based violence and including intimate partner violence, which emphasizes the urgency to ensure women have access to sexual and reproductive uh, healthcare and contraceptives, including emergency contraceptives and medical abortion. Policymakers should expand healthcare provider training on monitoring, supervision, and referral for medical abortion. In terms of research implications, future research studies should rigorously investigate the effectiveness and safety of self-administered medical abortion in the absence of healthcare provider supervision through the entirety of the medical abortion protocol and at later gestational ages. Finally, future research studies should also understand how to best inform and support women particularly marginalized women and girls, including in humanitarian settings, who choose to self-administer, including when to seek clinical care. Thank you very much for participating in this webinar. And for additional information, you may contact me, Katherine Gambier at kgambier at gmail.com. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks to Catherine if she does watch this for that presentation and I think uh, really timely research and um, very important outcomes for us to consider uh, as we heed the call to increase access to safe self-administered abortion so uh, we should get our hands on that paper and um, so now I can move on to introducing our second abstract presenter and this is Arianti Riznawati Imma. And Imma is a reproductive health program specialist at UNFPA in Indonesia. She has nearly 25 years of professional working experience in research, program development, and monitoring and evaluation in the area of maternal health, reproductive health, and community development. 
She's participated in various collaborative researches between Faculty of Public Health University of Indonesia and the Guttmacher Institute, as well as development of technocratic papers for the National Planning Agency of Indonesia. Ima is going to present to us on challenges in recording abortion-related complications at health facilities in settings where abortion is highly restricted. Over to you, Ima. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Um, so uh, this is the study that I did uh, prior to joining UNFPA from uh, my previous work uh, in my PhD thesis and also uh, when I joined uh, research with uh, University of Indonesia colleagues. So as you can see in here, uh, this is some background about abortion status in Indonesia. Abortion is widely restricted. For a long time, it's only allowed for medical indication to save the life of the women. Uh, in 2009, there are other provisions for abortion, including severe congenital defect and rape cases, as stated in the health law. Nonetheless, we know that unwanted pregnancy is occurring, and government family planning program itself only targeted for married couple, as stated in the population law. Uh, we also have a high unmet need for family planning. In the past 10 years, it, it remains 11%, 4% for spacing, and 7% for limiting. And uh, there are very limited studies uh, estimating incidence abortion in Indonesia. The, the last one we had is from 2000, estimating 2 million cases of abortion, including spontaneous uh, abortion. And the rate is 37 per 1,000 women aged 15 to 49 years. Next slide, please. So these are the objective of the study uh, to understand the challenges in recording and reporting of abortion where it is legal for limited grounds by assessing the patterns of abortion morbidities and uh, data completeness and to assess current situation using abortion related data and pattern of morbidities from the national health insurance data. Next slide please. So uh, the study in 2009 collected total number of cases with abortion-related diagnosis uh, within ICD code 000 to 008 from 1st January to 31st December from hospital providing uh, maternity services in Yogyakarta. Additionally, uh, selected variables of the cases were collected from the medical record. The collected variable refers to Ministry of Health individual inpatient obstetric morbidity form that was supposed to be reported by the hospital. Uh, we did descriptive analysis for several indicators commonly used to measure the burden of abortion morbidities. Next slide, please. The second, um, the second Analysis is using the national health insurance data uh, of 2015 and 2016. Uh, and uh, Indonesia is uh, endorsing national health insurance since 2014. And by 2019, it covers 80% of population. Uh, the data of the national health insurance scheme was sample of nearly 500,000 women aged 15 to 49 years who are member of the national health insurance. It was selected from a sample of nearly 1.7 million members providing, provided by the BPJS, the organization um, arranging for the JKN. Uh, similarly, we took the ICD code 008 to 008 uh, for diagnosis of abortion and descriptive analysis were applied for this. Uh, continue for the, for the next slide. So some information, next slide. Can we go to the next slide? So uh, about the, maybe I can just continue about the research location. So in here, uh, as you can see, um, this is the Indonesian. So Yogyakarta, this is about Yogyakarta. Actually, I think there is some problem with the slide. Uh, the study was conducted in uh, the Yogyakarta province, it is usually known uh, as Yogya, Yogyakarta. It's a very special uh, province. It's a small province in Indonesia. Um, it is known as student city and house many school and university. So it is common for many young people to come and stay temporarily in Yogyakarta to continue their education. Yogyakarta has five districts 
and many cities as, and as many cities there are reasonably high number of hospitals so it uh, provides a description about city characteristic in Indonesia continue to the next slide um, so Yogyakarta has is one of the province with the lowest TFR in Indonesia uh, but there has been an increase in the total fertility rate in the past decade from 1.8 to 2.2 while the TFR uh, in Indonesia actually decreased uh, by 0 0.2 in the past five years. And in the next slide, we can see um, here that uh, there is, although um, contraceptive use is quite high in Yogyakarta, but there is a high reliance on family planning, a traditional family planning method uh, from 12% in 2007 to 19% in 2017, which is 12% uh, is withdrawal and 6% is abstinence. And we know that use of traditional method is uh, associated with high incidence of uh, unintended pregnancy. And we can go to the next slide. Uh, here is a picture of, um, although some uh, people are usually against abortion, but herbs and medication for regulation or herbs to smooth. Oh are available everywhere and widely available in Yogyakarta. This is just some of the picture. And uh, this uh, shows that uh, this can be used and also can also create some uh, result of complication that you require hospitalization. And we can go to the next slide. Um, the study was done before the online um, shops are available. So at that time, there are many ads available in the local newspaper, as well as in the flyer pasted on the wall everywhere. So from this study, we learned that the seller uh, sell various medication, uh, such as gynecosid, uh, which is not for abortion, and recommending doses uh, three times higher than the medication. And safe abortion that may result in complications that require hospitalization. Can we go to the next slide, please? So uh, we are trying to collect data from 38 hospitals in the province. Uh, however, in reality, we can only get from 23 hospitals. And uh, we can go to the next slide. And yeah, so most of the diagnosis in the medical record refers to uh, physiological process of abortion as described in this slide. So threatened abortion when there is vaginal bleeding, but without uh, surgical dilatation and the uh, pregnancy may continue, and also in a, in a fetal abortion when pregnancy uh, usually cannot continue, incomplete abortion when there is a partial expulsion of product of conception, and complete abortion. So all the, in the, in the hospital, usually the diagnosis is referring to these stages of abortion. Next slide, please. And in here we can see uh, the classification of disease uh, of abortion uh, according to WHO. And uh, there is a code, a special code for spontaneous abortion, O03, and for um, medical abortion, which include legal and therapeutic abortion, O04. For each, de uh, for each dis division, there are also subcategory that refer to completeness and other additional complications. So back in 2009, uh, the, uh, the coding is not generally used in our research area. And from all cases, only 41% were assigned ICD code. And from interview with the medical record personnel, it was explained that the codes are especially given for cases where they need to do a reimbursement to the government. Next slide, please. This graph show uh, the diagnosis uh, of abortion. So, uh, Majority, 60% are cases are diagnosed as, as, as incomplete abortion, followed by blighted ovum. Most of the diagnoses were made based on the stage of abortion, as I mentioned before. However, despite the fact that by looking at the symptom of abortion, it is difficult to differentiate between spontaneous and induced abortion, 89% of in, incomplete abortion is later coded as spontaneous abortion. On the other hand, blighted ovum that is very, has a very specific category also, O02, seems to be more accurately coded as we can see in here, 98% are coded appropriately. Next slide, please. So in summary regarding the recording of abortion complication, we found that diagnosis upon admission was 
referring mostly on abortion process. Giving the ICD coding is generally used by the health information staff as a secondary st state step based on the information provided in the medical record. There was a common practice in different hospitals to categorize cases of incomplete abortion under spontaneous abortion category. Almost 90% of incomplete abortion are categorized as spontaneous abortion. Through observation and interview with health information staff, it was found that cases of incomplete, uh, of, uh, incomplete abortion are often categorized as ICD code 03.4 as incomplete abortion without complication. Despite the fact that symptoms of spontaneous uh, abortion and induced abortion are similar and the medical record do not provide complete information for making such determination. Next slide, please. So uh, from the, this is about the completeness of the data. From the medical record, we collected uh, 30 main variables, including sociodemographic status of the patient and diagnosis. We can see in here data availability range from 100 to 30 percent. Data related to administration of the hospital is more complete, while data relating the, to the reproductive health history are less available. Uh, we can go to the next slide. In summary, regarding the recording of abortion, we found problems related to discrepancy, eligibility of data inscription, poor handwriting, lack of standardized abbreviation of medical as well as uh, general terminologies. Uh, as shown in the graph before, missing information and data incompleteness is quite big. Data related to uh, hospital administration is more available, while data relating to patients' previous obstetric history, such as antenatal care, uh, use of family planning are usually less available in the medical record. Birth dates also not well recorded, but patient age is collected as substitute. So we see that there are so many problems in the medical record of the abortion-related complication cases. Emma, we have two minutes left. Um, now, the last year, in, 10 years after the study, we tried to uh, continue to the next slide. Uh, we, after the first study, we tried to revisit again the situation regarding abortion. Uh, of course, there are some changes in the context. Uh, in 2014, Indonesia launched the National Health Insurance Scheme. This is a really a wide coverage. Um, government also provides subsidy for the poor, but uh, the citizen, all citizens are expected to participate in the scheme. Uh, by 2019, 80% population are covered. In terms of law, there is no change in the regulation of, of law. Uh, abortion is legal for medical emergency for both women and for the uh, fetal abnormalities and also for rape cases as per health law. Uh, but there are new regulations like new government regulation number six on, of uh, 2014 for reproductive health and also there is, no, there is new uh, Ministry of Health regulation number three of 2016 on training and provision of abortion care for medical emergency and pregnancy uh, due to rape. But, and also there is new um, situation regarding abortion, misoprostol, although it is not um, registered for abortion and only registered for gast gastric ulcer in Indonesia, but it is widely available through online informal vendors. However, the price are high and also there is no mean of verific verifying um, the seller's legitimacy, inaccuracy and completeness of information and uh, dosage are quite big, and this is described in a recent study that currently under publication process. Now we are looking at the diagnosis of abortion in referral facilities. Next slide, please. Uh, this table, I have two more, ta uh, two more slides. Next slide, please. So uh, the slide shows that um, in here that Distribution of uh, abortion-related complication uh, treated in the referral facility in the hospital using the national health insurance data. In total, 0.2% women aged 15 to 49 years has used abortion-related treatment through the national health insurance. Most of them receive in the health uh, facility, referral health facility in the hospital. Uh, at first, we are actually want to compare the data of Yogyakarta, but since the number is very low, so we decided to use the national data. And the next slide is on the treatment of abortion in health facilities. In before this, I think there is another slide. Okay, yeah, and the treatment. Uh, this slide shows that. 
uh, treatment of abortion related complication in referral facilities usually use um, mild cortage and the uh, mild cortage and dilatation and cortage so as Although we know that the most recommended one is using manual and electric vacuum aspiration. So in conclusion, the last slide, almost 90% of incomplete abortion are categorized as spontaneous abortion. Uh, we feel that ICD-10 coding system to distinguish between spontaneous and induced abortion is kind of a problematic to use in countries where abortion is illegal or highly restricted. Women may avoid revealing their attempt to terminate pregnancy and health staff do not want to risk uh, being involved with any legal implication. There is a potential to use national health insurance data um, to assess the situation of abortion and abortion uh, care and management uh, because the national health insurance coverage is very big and they move to computer system uh, so it's easy to analyze. However, Data is not always accessible and we used to we usually wait for the published data set from the National Health Insurance uh, Administration Board. So I think that's the end my, of my presentation. So in here, uh, the last slide shows the panel of abortion masses in Borobudur Temple. Uh, this is just a reminder that actually the practice has been existing for a long time and even now the Indonesia is still facing unsafe abortion practices that may have contributing to the high burden of maternal mortality in Indonesia. Thank you for your attention and sorry for the technical glitch. No problem. Thank you, Emma. And uh, while there's a, a lot of information in that presentation, something that jumps out for me is that um, in order to ensure that self-administration of medical abortion is safe, uh, we really need the uh, accurate, high quality data. And I think this would not be a problem only in unrestricted, uh, sorry, restricted environments, but, but also sort of less restrictive environments. So um, great to have your recommendations at the end there um, on how to start addressing that. So thank you. And now I will introduce our next panel speaker. Uh, so uh, next person to talk to us is Maria Person. Uh, Maria is a sexual and reproductive health expert um, at IPAS Bangladesh. Uh, she has a background in development aid and has focused her attention and work on women's access to safe abortion and contraceptives. She's passionate about research and the study to be presented um, was conducted during her time as a research assistant at Karolinska Institutet. Institutet. Um, the title of Maria's abstract presentation is a qualitative study on healthcare providers' experiences in providing comprehensive abortion care in the humanitarian setting in Cox's Bazaar, Bangladesh. Over to you. Maria. Thank you very much, Amy. Okay, um, I'm very happy to be here today on this important day. And as uh, Amy mentioned, uh, I will be presenting findings from a study that I did um, together with colleagues uh, from Karolinska Institutet. So that was with my former engagement with Karolinska Institutet. And uh, this study uh, was funded by RFSU, which is the Swedish Association for Sexuality Education. And it's a qualitative study on healthcare providers' experiences and perception of providing comprehensive abortion care in humanitarian setting. And the setting at focus is Cox's Bazaar in Bangladesh. And now I will change the slide there we go um, just before i go into the research i just want to uh, share some key concepts and also about the abortion law in bangladesh but comprehensive abortion care includes safe abortion post-abortion care and contraceptive uh, provision and counseling in bangladesh uh, abortion are restricted unless necessary to save the mother's life However, menstrual regulation, which is a procedure to regulate the menstrual cycle to ensure a non-pregnancy, 
is permitted up to week 12 following a woman's last uh, menstrual period. And in this setting, uh, menstrual regulation and the methods for providing re menstrual regulation are those recommended by WHO for providing safe abortion care, which is either through medication, and here it's called menstrual reg regulation with medication, it's a combination of mifepristone and misoprostol, uh, or through manual vacuum aspiration, MVA. And in this context, uh, the pregnancy is established before providing um, menstrual regulation. Uh, the definition of menstrual regulation uh, is that you don't have to establish that there is a pregnancy, but in this context, uh, the pregnancy is established before providing care. Um, in addition to menstrual regulation, the healthcare providers also provide post-abortion care and contraceptives in Cox's Bazaar, uh, which are the other components of the comprehensive abortion care package. So the overall focus of the research is comprehensive abortion care in humanitarian setting and investigated through healthcare providers experience of providing MR pack and contraceptive services in Cox's Bazaar. So just a short background, which uh, previous speakers has already touched upon today. Uh, so we know that unsafe abortion contributes to maternal mortality and morbidity globally. And in humanitarian setting, women and girls face an increased risk of unsafe abortion. Um, and this due to an increased risk of sexual violence and rape and pre-existing -ex patterns of discrimination and violence being aggravated in crisis settings. At the same time, there is limited access to comprehensive abortion care in humanitarian crisis. Um, there is limited research that focuses solely on safe abortion care in humanitarian settings, but if we look at sexual and reproductive health and care, um, in humanitarian setting, we can find some of the following barriers um, to providing comprehensive package that also then includes safe abortion services. And that is a lack of prioritization of safe abortion care in humanitarian setting, lack of training, uh, lack of equipment and supplies, and a lack of knowledge on the abortion law, that is human, humanitarian actors providing care, not being aware of the legality of, the, uh, of abortion in the setting they are working. And then stigma and negative attitudes uh, affecting service provision. Some of these barriers we will find in non-humanitarian setting as well. But as I said, there's limited research that focuses on safe abortion care and comprehensive abortion care in humanitarian settings. So this study aims to uh, contribute to filling, filling that gap. And uh, Cox's Bazaar is a district in uh, Bangladesh. You see the little circle there, it's borders to Myanmar. Uh, over 900,000 Rohingya refugees from Myanmar lives in Cox's Bazaar. And Cox's Bazaar is one of the most densely populated, populated refugee settlements in the world. And the Rohingya, uh, Rohingyas are a Muslim minority uh, predominantly from the western uh, Rakhine state in Myanmar, which is close to the border of Bangladesh. And the Rohingya population in Myanmar has faced persecution for decades, but there were escalating violence in 2017 that resulted in their, uh, they having to flee to uh, Cox's Bazar in Bangladesh, and also resulted then in the ongoing humanitarian crisis. And the UN fact-finding mission to Myanmar found large scales uh, of the incidents of rape and sexual violence by the Myanmar military. And following displacement, Rohingya women and girls have continued to face different forms of sexual and gender-based violence. And the humanitarian response in Cox's Bazar is led by the government of Bangladesh in collaboration with the UNHCR, IOM, and the UN resident coordinator. And if we look at uh, uh, the healthcare uh, services, uh, we 
In March 2019, there were 142 basic healthcare facilities and also eight hospitals in the refugee camps. And these are managed by the government of uh, Bangladesh or by NGOs. And menstrual regulation, post-abortion care and contraceptive services were provided free of charge at 29 of these facilities. And the aim of the study was to explore healthcare providers' perception and experience of providing comprehensive abortion care in the humanitarian setting in Cox Bazar, and also to identify some of the barriers and facilitators in service provision. It's a descriptive exploratory study, and uh, the sampling was done purposefully with assistance from IPAS Bangladesh, uh, which is an organization that is involved with the humanitarian response in Cox's Bazar. Uh, we conducted 24 in-depth interviews, and 19 of the interviews were with healthcare providers. 16 of whom are par were paramedics and three doctors. And these were conducted face to face at or close to their work in Cox's Bazaar inside the refugee camps. And paramedics, they are a mid-level provider and they have been deployed uh, um, in Cox's Bazaar for the purpose of providing MR pack and contraceptives and also are the main providers of MRPAC and contraceptives. So therefore the majority of the respondents are paramedics. Doctors uh, were included as they are the ones who provide MR above week 10. So paramedics are uh, able to provide MR up to week 10 following a woman's last menstrual period. And then doctors are allowed up to week 12. Uh, but uh, there's also scarcity of doctors and therefore the number of doctors interviews were fairly low. Uh, additionally, we conducted five in-depth interviews with key informants um, and these were conducted both in December and in March and the data in Cox's Bazaar work was collected in March 2019 and the data was analyzed using an inductive qualitative content analysis approach. And from the data, uh, four categories emerged and healthcare providers experience and perception of providing care in Cox's Bazaar are or were influenced by these categories. So the first category is about the uh, collaboration and organization of, of uh, CAC. And it shows that the MR policy uh, provided a favorable legal environment for MR PAC and family planning in Cox's Bazaar. MR uh, is also provided throughout of Bangladesh, uh, so the MR policy already being in place provided a favorable environment. And there was a good collaboration among humanitarian actors and with the government of Bangladesh and the key informants reported that this was an enabling factor for provision of CAC in a humanitarian setting. And the healthcare providers expressed having a supportive work environment, both when it came to their colleagues, but also within the organization that they worked. And in contrast to other research on uh, safe abortion care in low resource settings, non-humanitarian, but also research on sexual and reproductive health in humanitarian settings, both the healthcare providers and key informants expressed that their supply and equipment was readily available and also that it was uh, adequate. However, Although the supplies were available, they were not maybe always accessible. Implants and IUD was not available at all the facilities and implants, uh, which can only be administered by doctors, and then there's a scarcity of doctors, meant that uh, there was limited accessibility. Uh, they were providing implants on campaign days, which could happen uh, one to two, uh, two times a month or more frequently or less frequently. 
Another finding was the Mexico City policy, uh, the global gag rule uh, that uh, Siva spoke about earlier, which affected organizations' willingness to provide MR services. And what happened is that although organizations might have the capacity to provide MR services, they are not willing or unable to provide MR services due to not wanting to lose funding but they still want to provide family planning services. So then it became a little bit of a dispute about who, uh, which organization should provide family planning services. Although the uh, key informant said that this dispute hadn't gone out of hand, it did lead to a lack of space for some of the um, MR providers. Uh, so in uh, facilities where there were several organizations involved in family planning. The MR providers got a little bit less space. But uh, there was also a lack of space mentioned in the government managed facilities. And the next category is about confidence, competence and pride affecting healthcare providers. So the healthcare providers, they felt confident, uh, confident that they provided good services. And they, those who could adopt the same dialect that was similar to the, the language spoken by the Rohingya population felt that it facilitated trust. The healthcare providers also took pride in their work and which created a positive identity and uh, in an enabling environment. Here is a quote from one of the paramedics. I feel happy that from a worst case scenario, I help the girl to a new life. I love these things with a job to help and protect people from danger. The healthcare providers felt adequately trained in MR pack and family planning and had received training from NGOs before deployment, but there was limited knowledge on the abortion law and also on the MR policy. Uh, the third category is about the perception about um, abortion and MR services. So abortion was defined as spontaneous abortion, termination of pregnancy after week 12, or as post-abortion care. And MR, on the other hand, was described as regulation of the menstrual cycle and something that happened before the heartbeat. And before a certain gestational age, uh, the embryo was not considered to be a child and thus not sinful to abort. And here's one provider using this in their counseling then. In my experience, I think the baby don't have hands and legs till 10 weeks. At that time, the baby is like an egg yolk. And when there is a client who needs MR, we make them understand that it's not a sin. And we tell them this is just like a duck egg or chicken egg. And it's just like liquid yolk inside your body. Two more and, minutes. Yeah, the last category is about healthcare providers understanding of the Rohingya women and the population they served. So healthcare providers perceive the Rohingya communities as patriarchal and Rohingya women as religious and conservative. And this at times led uh, the healthcare providers to having condescending attitudes, which also affected healthcare providers' understanding of women's need and desire. So their perception affected their understanding. Here is uh, one provider who says that Rohingya women don't want to take implant and ID because uh, of their, uh, they think they will go to hell if they die with this thing in their body. Um, the healthcare provider tried to adjust their counseling and then they used their religion and motherhood to increase the acceptance. So the perception of the Rohingya community made them then adjust their counseling so um, here is one provider who says, we tell them that MR is not a sin because it will save your family, make you and your newborn child happy. You already have a child. If you take another baby now, you will get bad impact on your health. You cannot give your children enough care. So take MR and care for your family. So emphasizing uh, motherhood and the importance of of motherhood in their counseling to increase acceptance. So in conclusion, um, based on the uh, participants' experience, the study findings suggest that 
comprehensive abortion care can be implemented, provision can be scaled up in a humanitarian setting under rapidly changing circumstances. However, access to and availability of quality uh, comprehensive abortion care was limited as shown in the result. The large number of actors that are involved in delivering SRHR programs in Cox's Bazar creates an opportunity to increase access to and availability of quality uh, abortion care. Training uh, is needed on the MR policy and the abortion law, also in-service training that includes value clarification to ensure that uh, care is provided uh, non-judgmental and that the care is women-centered. But to fully understand traje trajectories to abortion-related care in the humanitarian setting in Cox's Bazaar, research is need, uh, more research is needed to understand Rohingya women's health-seeking behaviors and Rohingya women's encounter with abortion-related care from their own perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. That was really, really interesting and it resonated a lot with um, the work we do. And I think it touched on many of our conference themes as well of uh, linking supply and demand and um, definitely around um, uh, sexual reproductive health in a changing dynamic environment in humanitarian settings. So really interesting. Thank you. So that is the end of our abstract presentations and of also of our um, uh, panel presentations. So I just really want to say this is this has been great. I've just uh, been inspired, really. And I mean, we've heard a lot about the challenges to safe abortion uh, access already felt across the world due to COVID-19. But we've also heard that we should see this situation as an opportunity and not just an exacerbation of the barriers we already uh, need to tackle. I think the abstract presentations provided us with evidence base for addressing some of these barriers. And we should also all remember that the governments have made commitments to achieve sustainable development goals, which include safe abortion policies and programs. Um, I also just want to note our virtual conference session, it's held at a very busy uh, time of year for our sector. We, we just celebrated uh, World Contraception Day on Saturday the 26th. And also around um, International Safe Abortion Day, there's a richness of webinars uh, out there and on these topics at the moment. Uh, I do just want to um, uh, plug one, uh, just to call your attention to later today, there's a briefing by partners, Mari Stokes International, IPAS and Asia Safe Abortion Partnership to launch the latest My Body, My Voice report uh, with new data on global trends in safe abortion access. So this report um, contains new findings from interviews with over 1,800 women who accessed a safe abortion service. And given the focus of this year's International Safe Abortion Day on safe self-managed abortions, the briefing will include presentations on how we can support self-administration safely, including via pharmacy provision and other models. Um, so with that, I will wrap up. I think um, uh, if you go out there to the sort of campaign website, you'll find all sorts of other um, advocacy activities going on, but uh, I think best we hand over and start to uh, uh, start our question and answer session. So thank you. Thanks for listening to me. Thanks for listening to all the presenters. Um, and uh, over to you, Shobha. Uh, thank you, Amy. Thank you very much. And could you please share the link with us uh, of the session? Which you Absolutely. Have... Yes, yes. <laughs> you can share with all of us on the chat box. Thank I you. will. Yes. Yep. yes. Uh, so we now have the open session and uh, participants, please type in your comments or questions in the chat box. As I said earlier, and those uh, watching on Facebook can type it in the comments box on the Facebook page. And we already have a lot many questions with us. Also, lot many com uh, not comments, but lot many thank yous for the wonderful presentations. Uh, which I'm sure the presenters must have read, but uh, every presentation has been thanked for, for being so rich in content. And uh, we have a comment from Dr. H.K. Das, uh, who is Deputy Director, Regional Medical Research Center of ICMR, Indian Council of Medical Research for the Northeast Region in the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. And uh, Dr. Das says, besides having safe and planned abortion services, 
the availability and accessibility of these services for women is of utmost importance and only then can we have a win win situation for all women and i think he has said that very very rightly that accessibility is very is key uh, the services ought to be there but uh, there means they ought to reach the people who are reach the women who are in uh, need of them uh, we have a question from deepak dhungal country program manager aids healthcare foundation of nepal and deepak wants to know uh what are the successful initiatives or good practices in promoting safe abortion in those countries where abortion is not legalized or is considered a sin from religious point of view so any successful initiatives or good practices um, would any of the presenters or plenary speakers like to share their thoughts Yes, so Chitra and Shiva, would you like to share, say something? Yeah, hi. Uh, so thank you very much for that um, very relevant question. Uh, I just want to say that the experience, again, you know, where it is considered a sin and it is um, influenced by religious beliefs. Uh, I have found uh, in many of the countries we work in that a lot of the religious beliefs depend on interpretation. That one of the strategies that I have heard of, which works, is to find religious leaders who are able to interpret the existing texts or uh, you know beliefs in a more uh, liberal, broad-minded way. Uh, and another strategy which we know has worked for many years now in Latin America is what is called harm reduction, where uh, you know the doctors uh, give the information about uh, mifepristone, misoprostol, or safe abortion services uh, simply as a right to information. and the women are told uh, that you know if there are any complications or problems they should then come to the health uh, service facility where they are treated uh, as we discussed uh, as we heard the sharing from ima and others where they are treated as do it's a um, spontaneous abortion uh, which needs uh, to be taken care of so you know nobody is really complicit in uh, supporting the women but they are able to bypass this whole religious uh, sin uh, belief Uh, so those are the two strategies that i'm aware of that have worked in in many of the places i don't know whether any of the other speakers would like to share something okay would uh, seva like to share something because uh, yeah so um i think that um in the countries that we have worked in we can definitely see that um <clears throat> as suchitra puts it the interpretation is really important amongst the schools of islam i mean not all of them say uh, abortion is uh, well one says abortion is not permissible but there are like three or four others which allow abortion for different uh, reasons or for different grounds and up to 90 days you know so uh, in like for example in malaysia that is what is like kind of um, put into um, uh, the religious national official religious fatwa however of course the term limitations pose a difference uh, i mean it's difficult uh, but um, the second thing is that sometimes the service provider themselves has a different idea of what the religious interpretation is and then poses more barriers right uh, interestingly enough on many uh places like for example we think that indonesia's version of uh, islam is far more liberal to what is being a uh, what is being um how do i say uh, uh interpreted in malaysia but yet their uh, understanding of uh, uh abortion is far more restrictive you know uh, in a number of ways so i think that um, so one is to make sure that uh, we make them aware of what are the liberal interpretations like to show them that possibilities of um what is you know what is possible even within the framework of religion but of course always understanding that working with religious leaders for us as feminists um always comes with some sort of caveats because they may be okay with some forms like they can say with a uh, you know uh, abortion within 90 days is fine but lgbtiq is no no uh, or uh, you know comprehensive sexuality education or access to services for young people having sex outside the frame of a marriage is a no no right so we need to understand whose voices we need to elevate within this um, uh, discourse um i think there's the uh, um uh, all of the different religions pose different sorts of um 
how do I say, uh, barriers. And I think Dr. Shivon has said that in, in Buddhism as well, there has become some uh, caveats and wants to know about uh, Buddhist monks, right? Yeah. Um, unfortunately, actually, I think that a, maybe uh, beyond an era pre-globalization, uh, we often used to think that uh, Buddhists had a much more... Um, compassionate or humane view. Uh, in the early years, I used to remember that the Buddhist uh, monks uh, in um, near my area, in the country that I lived in, which is of course Malaysia, um, they actually would say that, okay, this is like a small sin that you've committed and then you can like kind of, um, how do I say, uh, uh, you can pay penance for it by giving food or giving doing some form of charity or releasing some birds, you know, something like that. Uh, I think the gravity of the sin was something that uh, has actually been kind of uh, brought about as debate from the evangelicals in the US and of course Catholics, uh, because then they said, well, how can you think this is a very small minor thing? I mean, if you, you as a religious person needs to value life, right? So that's, I think, think that how religious fundamentalists kind of share knowledge and set standards amongst each other on morality, you know, so uh, that's something we really need to look at uh, countering. Okay, and uh, I just so, uh, want to, to say a very warm welcome to Dr. Shivan Var, who's the founder executive director of the Productive Health Association of Cambodia, and also the convener of APCR SHR 10 for being with us today and raising a very pertinent question. Uh, Maria, would you like to add something? Yes, thank you. Um, I agree uh, with the, the, the previous speakers here now, but I also, I think it's quite interesting in Bangladesh where we have a restrictive abortion law. So abortion is only permissible when it is to save a woman's life, uh, but to kind of circumvent then the stigma that is around abortion we have the MR policy and menstrual regulation has been um, part of the healthcare services since the end of the the 70s and this is I think it's interesting to see how you can uh, work to ensure access uh, to essential health services and work with women's rights, even in uh, settings where abortion is highly stigmatized. But on the other hand, um, it can also lead to abortion continuing to be stigmatized and that we don't actually work with trying to reduce the stigma that is around abortion. Um, so I think also very important that we need to work with the interpretation of the abortion law and also interpretation of religion as, as just mentioned now. Thank you. Uh, we have uh, a comment as well as an uh, inbuilt question perhaps from Air Natakan from Thailand. And Air says that in Thailand, safe abortion services and access to contraceptives is very much available but still teenage pregnancy is a challenge. And there are gender issues too, uh, like in some temples, menstruating women are not allowed to enter and some gender stereotypes also need to be addressed along with legal bar barriers and policy incoherence. And I'm sure uh, uh, Suchitra will agree with us, uh, with me that uh, uh, in India, we have lot many taboos against menstruating women. And even amongst the educated women I have found they would not take part in any religious ceremonies and uh, not amongst the uh, uneducated, but even the urban women. So would any of the panelists like to address that or say something? About that? Uh, should I say something? Yes, please do. So, yeah, thanks, uh, Shobha. I think as you said quite rightly, across our region, uh, menstrual stigma and taboos are very much a part of the culture. Uh, we know that just uh, last year, I think Nepal actually finally outlawed the practice of menstruating girls uh, staying outside yeah. the home when one of the girls, I think, had a scorpion bite and uh, actually died as a result of that. Yeah. So we know that these are deeply rooted patriarchal socio-cultural norms and a lot of unlearning and relearning will be needed uh, because I see this as a continuity, you know, the stigma that attaches to menstruation 
and therefore to sexuality and therefore to abortion so it's uh, you know as i said it's very difficult to unravel one without really uh, uh, attempting to unpack the other um and these are very real and very difficult uh, negotiations to make uh, particularly in countries where uh, you know religious beliefs uh, are still very strong uh, within the community uh, and i think one uh, you know as um, as we all know when working with religious leaders you need to also be a little careful of uh, ensuring that we are respecting the spiritual um you know background of that religion while questioning the actual practices which we know ha- more have a cultural uh, backing rather than actually you know religious scriptures telling you to do a certain thing so it's a tricky negotiation but i think that's part of our role as uh, advocates and i think we do need to invest in uh, looking into that yeah thank you emma would you like to add something to that Well, I think in Indonesia context, uh, yes. the contraceptive for unmarried is not available. So we do have a lot of um, work to do, and I think um, education is very important to have a proper education for the adolescents because uh, that is the situation. Although um, many of uh, civil society organization also working in in providing um, services. but i think it's very um, we have to really adjust the situation and also to understand our our supporter in term of the religious leaders because uh, i think the moderate religious leaders what i found in indonesia they are more uh, passive while the the conservative the conservative one is the one who are always uh, voicing their voice very strongly so people are listening having their voice more uh, represented in the in social media in everywhere thank you uh, kalpana acharya very senior journalist from nepal and she heads uh, health tv online uh, in uh, nepal she says only 41% females in nepal know about safe abortion law uh, even it has been there for 18 years uh, and there is another question uh, regarding that that uh, what happens what is the situation in countries where abortion is legal like she says in uh, nepal even in india uh, what about the situation of unsafe abortions in such countries even before the pandemic forget about how the pandemic has affected it but uh, despite abortion being legal uh, are women uh, able to make use of those services i'm sure all our panelists would like to say something to that Amy, would you like to say a few words? Can you repeat that? Sorry, I didn't hear. Yes, have... even even in countries where it is legal, abortion is legalized. Uh, what is the situation of unsafe abortions taking place? Uh, even before the pandemic, forget about the pandemic, but even before the pandemic, is it? I think, and Dr. Shavon would would definitely be able to uh, contribute here. But I think what we have is. Uh, we we don't know i think there's a lot of um lack of data on this and it's been a while since there's been any research and we're waiting for the latest um dhs to be released that may or may not provide that data um so but but we do know i mean we get a lot of calls to our contact center and we hear uh, women's experience through that um and case studies we collect but we we haven't really got any broad rigorous research giving us that that information yeah uh, and dr shivan if you're there <laughs> yes yes dr shivan if yes dr shivan would you like to add something to that i do not know if he's there or he has left uh yes seva would you like to add something to it? Seva, are you there? Oh, I can jump yeah. in. <laughs> yes, yes, please. In do. the mean, in the meantime. Please. No, no, please do. Yeah, yes. I think maybe it was um, Suchitra who uh, spoke about not viewing it as a, as a single issue, but we need. To, so we need to work on multiple fronts. We can't just make a uh, one policy will not change everything. We need to bring awareness. We need to make things available and accessible so we need to work on um, multiple fronts and i think that that is something that's really important so we uh, 
even though a policy is one step, then we also need awareness and we need information and education. We need accessibility, availability. So I think that is an important thing to and remember that we need to work on multiple, multiple fronts. Uh, can I add something? Yeah, yes, please. Thanks. Uh, so that's a very pertinent question from Kalpana Ji. And I think, uh, you know, the situation in India and Nepal is in many ways similar. Uh, and I must say that in India, although the abortion law was passed in 1971, we still have a very high number of people uh, who don't know that abortion is legal. So, you know, in Nepal, it's been only 18 years. Uh, we've had it for so many decades. And it's not just women in the community. Sometimes we find even the healthcare workers are not aware. And a similar uh, situation as with Nepal, uh, in India for the last two decades, there has been a lot of conversation publicly and through government policies and programs, which has spoken out against sex determination which has unfortunately conflated the issue with abortion access. So a lot of the messaging that went out in the community actually doubled the stigma around abortion by uh, talking about the whole sex determination issue, which should have been spoken in the context of gender discrimination, but not attached to abortion. Uh, you know, So I think that really took us backwards uh, in, in uh, many ways. And even now it's difficult to have a conversation around safe abortion rights uh, without it being sort of hijacked by the whole sex selection issue. Um, and in terms of awareness, as uh, you know, uh, as I have said earlier, uh, I think it's uh, the whole stigma around women's sexuality, the silence around it, the shaming of it, the making it sinful, and the glorification of motherhood. Uh, it all makes it very, very difficult to openly talk about safe abortion. If you see even our cultural practices, you know, there's so much celebration of pregnancy. Uh, we have these, uh, you know, when a woman is seven months pregnant, you have all these ceremonies and, and programs. And that too, only within the context of marriage. Uh, so this is what, something I, I often say, and some of you may have heard me say that many times before, is that marriage becomes like a watershed moment in a woman's life, you know. Before that, you can never have sex. After that, you must have sex because marital rape is not criminalized. Before that, you can't get pregnant. After that, you must get pregnant because infertility is also stigmatized. So if you see really the whole, you know, progression of sexual and reproductive health matters across life, we find that it's often women's sexuality or always women's sexuality that gets stigmatized, which makes it very difficult to talk openly about these issues, which are not in line with what is seen as being a good woman, a good wife, a good mother. And not wanting to be a mother uh, is, you know, is, is something very difficult to have conversations around. So I think it's, it's you know, too many issues that one need to be dealt with before one can uh, address this issue. But thank you for that question. It was very interesting. Thanks. Right, rightly so. Uh, we have a question from Prabhavanti from Jakarta, Indonesia. Uh, and of course, she mentions 26 September and 28 September being connected as we had the contraceptive day on um, 26 September and now today safe abortion day. She says our long term goal, which should be achieved as SAP must be to ensure that every pregnancy is wanted and no unintended pregnancy should be conceived at all. And that can happen only if women and men can access and use options to prevent unintended pregnancies. And she wants to know any, she, she said out of the box uh, measures, but I'm correcting that to any new box insights from our panelists. <laughs> Taking Suchitra's cue. <laughs> so let's change the box. <laughs> Yes, so Chitra says, Yeah, can I can I pitch in? So this reminds me, I had a professor many decades ago who used to say that our society is so confused about things that we are able to buy cigarettes, uh, you know, uh, over the counter, but you need a prescription for contraception. Uh, he said it should actually be the other way around. Uh, so I think, um, as you said quite rightly, you know, we need to find ways to prevent unintended pregnancies, but we must recognize that there are some planned pregnancies which could also become unwanted. Uh, so, you know, the conversation of contraception versus abortion is always a little worrying for me because it kind of makes it sound as though if you give contraceptive services to everyone, you will uh, you know, avoid or reduce number of abortions. But contraceptive measures also fail. No method is 100% effective. And as a gynecologist, I can tell you there are journal articles written about women who become pregnant after hysterectomy. You know, you leave the ovaries behind and somehow there's a pregnancy and it embeds in the abdomen. So one must recognize that the force of nature is really towards conception you know, as a survival instinct, uh, which is what makes it so difficult to, to manage uh, contraception. I think we need to also look at the gendered perspective of this. Uh, look at how few methods are available for men to use, uh, whereas most of the methods are for women to use. And in reality, a woman can get pregnant only once a month 
whereas a man can make someone pregnant every time he has sex uh, so somewhere the gendering um, you know and the uh, sort of dynamics of that also need to be addressed and again as with all other questions i think these are very long term uh, investments that need to be made uh, but always to recognize that planned pregnancies could also become unwanted for various reasons uh, so the need for safe abortions will always remain no matter how much we invest in contraception okay thank you uh, seba would you like to add something please yeah i think uh, in on top of what suchitra says but to also you know move towards having safe sex as the kind of framework so uh, beyond like getting pregnant and not getting pregnant is also to be free of like uh, diseases um, and uh, you know uh, and ensure uh, sexuality and pleasure and freedom and autonomy are there um i think so that kind of overall framework understanding how our needs and desires will evolve through the years and to have like a a system a political system as well as a health system that is like responsive to people um expressing ourselves uh, and enjoying our rights within that context is also something that's uh, uh you know i guess it's like a another box but <laughs> but it's a very big box uh that we are trying to create right so i think that these are the things that we are demanding but uh, i am not sure where governments and policy makers are with like moving beyond in that framework right if i'm not mistaken uh, shobha in between there was also a world vasectomy day i'm wondering like why is it that you know uh, more governments don't actually look at uh, vasectomy as an option for uh men as well so you know this is uh, one of the things that um we have to consider yes you are very right seva and this has uh, in fact every time i keep on asking this question and every time i think the panelists also say and from what i read you know on the web also if i look at some website which is uh, maybe related to uk or us they will uh, out of the Uh, prevention options they will say vasectomy is the cheapest and the best but in the in asia at least in south asia and southeast asia if you look at the figures i think it is it, it is dismally almost 0% i would call uh, the vasectomy and it's always the female who is to undergo everything so i think these are questions which i keep on asking and you are right to raise this and governments i think there is not much of programming Uh, done from the government part also because the easiest way out where whereas it's a very difficult uh, of a very difficult medical intervention as far as uh, the surgery is concerned but you are very right and suchitra i was reading about some uh, uh, male contraceptive injectable male contraceptive called rijog which is has been there uh, I, i was hearing that it will get uh, uh, cl clearance uh, and will uh, from uh, Uh, the indian uh, 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 as prospect and i do not know if it has been icmr was saying that they have completed the studies i think the doctor has been working on it for quite some time yeah so uh, we've been hearing about this since i was a medical student so it's yes, been many yes. decades we've been hearing about this new invention yes. i mean yes. hoping it comes through but you know when you said about governments not investing in programs equally for male contraception it's not just governments it's also i would say big pharma i mean look at the research you know, yes about, yes you know, how much of investment is being made in uh, researching for men and uh, underlying that is also the subtle uh, it's a stereotype which attaches to men as well as women is that you know men will not be can't, can't be dependent on to be responsible to take something like say a pill every day uh, or if there's anything which has a side effect which affects the erectile function then you know you can't really expect them to do it Uh, even something like condoms we find very often the excuse being made is the man doesn't get as much pleasure out of it uh, so you know i think somewhere we need to look at the stereotype of men as well as women within this patriarchal structure and unless we actively looking for it like one of the examples i give in our workshops usually is viagra mm. you know how how much easier is it to get viagra which is in a sense not therapeutic it is meant to improve your sexual pleasure Yeah. Uh, it's not it's not treating something which is like a life threatening disorder uh, and actually people have died from using viagra but it's still available whereas medical abortion pill actually saves lives and is therapeutic uh, and you know you have so many barriers like in india also you need to have a prescription and triplicate um, uh, sometimes i will find the people want me to check the patient's telephone number you know cross check what is written so all kinds of privacy violations 
when it is actually therapeutic and we know it saves lives. So, you know, the gendering uh, takes place in every kind of possible system and we need to be aware of that so that we are then able to uh, work against it or change it. Thank you. We have already overshot the time, uh, but uh, uh, there is just one comment from Paulia, uh, Polly Cabia from uh, Family Welfare Association of Cook Islands. And she says that in Cook Islands, abortion is restricted. Hence, we ensure ready access to emergency contraception, especially for girls and women to prevent unintended pregnancies. And so, Chitra, you mentioned about uh, emergency contraception just now. And one last question, which we want a take home message from all our panelists today. And the question is from Camille Tijamo. Camille says, what can we do as individuals to ensure women have access to safe abortions? And I would add to that unintended pregnancies. So I think I, we need a take home message from each one of you. <laughs> so Chitra, you can start and then everyone we will tell. Sorry, I seem to be doing too much of the talking. But yeah, that's a wonderful question to ask. And I would give like a very simple suggestion. Uh, as individuals, what we can do is just continue to speak out about the issue. Uh, when we talk to policymakers, you know, we say speak truth through power. But sometimes, honestly, it's as simple as if someone makes a sexist joke on your WhatsApp group, uh, step back and ask them, explain to them why this is not appropriate, because it's all linked. You know, unless you can um, challenge someone's sexism, it's very difficult to then start talking about women's rights and reach a point where you can have a conversation about safe abortion. Uh, make sure you challenge things which are, uh, you know, take away someone's autonomy or agency. Look at the various intersectional frameworks as an individual, try to do better. But also speak out when you see injustice being done elsewhere, whether it is in words or in actions. So I think that would be my take home message for everyone. Thank you. Amy? Uh, I, similar, I just think we need to just talk about it. We need to take the stigma mm -hmm. out of it. We need to make it comfortable for everyone to speak about it. Um, uh, yeah, and especially young people, just to, to normalize uh, talking about this a bit more. Thank you. Seva? Yeah, so I just wanted to add that, you know, in the household that I was growing up in, uh, so we used to have like uh, many women, right? I mean, even including our helpers, our aunts, and then our grandmothers and there was a lot of conversation that normally took place you know and sometimes it was about uh, reproductive intentions or unintended pregnancy because you know you would find somebody had come in uh, or a, one of our helpers would have an abusive relationship so I think that having these safe spaces for women to talk about I mean kind of set standards and sets the norm for even the next generation listening in, right? Uh, I'm not sure that, you know, with this kind of uh, hectic schedules that all of us lead now, whether that time for conversation is enough. But because, uh, you know, all of this uh, biological imperatives that are placed on women, as well as gender roles that are created by this biology, you know, um, I think that if we were actually enabling um, all of us to have these conversations on a regular basis. What does it mean to be in a supportive relationship? What does it mean to be in a supportive house situation? What does it mean to be in a supportive employment environment, you know, that supports this kind of uh, thing? This kind of concretely move to putting women at the center of the discourse, you know, so that would be what I'd say. Thank you, very rightly said. Maria? Yes. Thank you. Um, I have to agree with, <laughs> with everyone who was before me here. But I also think that as an individual, we can speak up. Um, and uh, also, I think one thing is to be aware of how our own discourse, like how we speak not only about abortion, but how we speak about women, how do we speak about men, um, are we contributing to the gender stereotypes, um, and also be aware, like who, how does the way that I speak uh, also, you know, contribute to the overall discourse um, and kind of uh, dare to challenge that a bit, I would say. Thank you. Uh, Emma? 
Yeah, I think there are already a lot said by other presenters. I think for me, it's very important to bring data because uh, when we talk uh, to policymakers, for example, they really need data. And sometimes the data on abortion or abortion complication is very difficult to get, but there are available data outside there. And then how to, to interpret them in an understanding manner so people can, can really uh, understand how is the situation. Uh, for example, if there are so many uh, abortion complication it may an indication of uh, unsafe abortion practices around there and something must be done for that. So I think that's uh, from my side, I think we have to bring more data to the discussion. Yes, thank you. Bring more data and also conversation. As many of you have said, I think conversation and dialogue in our even day to day conversations, I think we have to bring these things up to break the stereotypes. Uh, and I'm sure that is going to help. I'm sorry, some questions couldn't be taken up because already I think I have the sword hanging on my neck because we have overshot the time. So the questions can be addressed to the respective uh, speakers to get answers. And now with this, we come to the close of this eighth session of APCR SHR 10 virtual. And my sincere thanks to the chairperson, plenary speakers, abstract presenters, and to the participants, to each one of them. And I would also like to thank UNFPA and IPPA for their continuous support and help to APCR SHR 10 virtual. We will now meet again on Monday, October 12th at 1 p.m. Cambodia time for the next APCR SHR 10 virtual session on the theme of humanitarian response and SRHR in Asia Pacific. So bye for now, stay safe, stay healthy, and stay connected. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you very much.